Good evening, and please turn in God's Word to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. I'm not entirely sure when next we're going to be in Ecclesiastes uh, on account of my not preaching in some evenings and the 50th anniversary weekend and then my taking some leave. So this might be the last sermon until sometime in end of November, beginning of December, and even then we've got the evening services in December that are taken up by either carol services or we also suspend them for a few weeks as well. So it's not entirely beyond the realm of possibility that this might be the last time we're in Ecclesiastes this year, and mainly return in January, but we'll, we'll see what happens with the schedule because things do change. But Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and... Um, I'm looking at verses 13 to 18. I think I put the wrong, num wrong verses in the bulletin, but verses 13 to 18. And really this whole sermon is almost an introduction to the next sermon when we get into the thick of it in chapter 10. Let's read, and then we'll, I'll pray and begin. I've also seen this example of wisdom under the sun, and it seemed great to me. There was a little city with few men in it, and a great king came against it and besieged it, building great siege works against it. But there was found in it a poor, wise man, and he by his wisdom delivered the city. Yet no one remembered that poor man. But I say that wisdom is better than might, though the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. The words of the wise heard in quiet are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, the subject of wisdom is not one that is new to us, though it is one that we seem to repeatedly need to relearn we are prone to wander, Lord, we feel it, prone to leave you, the God whom we love. And therefore, we ask you that once again, you would teach us wisdom, 
Teach us by your word. Grant to us wisdom as you have promised in, in your word. And help us, Lord, to grasp it and to be consistent with it and to walk in its ways and paths for your honor and glory. Amen. Philip Ryken records the details of a letter that he received from a missionary family somewhere in the Middle East, recounting their struggles there, speaking of spiritual attack, of theft, of transport issues, of health, of danger, of sanitation, of sickness and cold. But what was particularly challenging and thought-provoking about the, the letter was their chosen response to each of these incidents. Our natural response is probably quite different from their chosen response. You see, in the letter, first they listed their hardships, and then side by side with each item, they gave a parallel list of a wiser and better way to look at each of these things. In other words, how they were choosing to approach it. So let me read to you the two lists, holding the one over and against the other. Or the other way around. They began by saying, deep spiritual oppression and harassment. Privileged to shine as stars in this inky black night. Mail, packages and wallets stolen, phone tapped. Great reminders that our lives are not our own. No longer do we have the convenience of a car. No longer do we have the expense of a car. Very dangerous driving conditions and traffic. A good public transportation system to use. Tight and challenging times facing us now. Many opportunities to prayerfully trust Him. Mud colored tap water flows from our faucets. Sparkling, life-giving water flows from our lives. Many aggressive viruses and lingering illnesses. Truly thankful spirits for his healing touch. A cold apartment when you have the flu. Hot drinks, blankets, massages, and prayers that warm us up. And I wonder if we would have responded that way. Let's allow that to be rhetorical to avoid embarrassment, shall we? This is an example of the excellence of wisdom in action, benefiting not just them, the missionary parents, but also their children, also their supporters, and all likelihood those that they intend to reach in the intended mission field. And as people see Christ in them, the love of Christ, the joy of Christ, the contentedness before the throne of Christ. Now, of course, this is not saying that we want our missionaries to practice triumphalism and pretend that everything is always right and never goes wrong. Notice how honest they were in this letter. They told us exactly what the trials were. But it's just saying that godly wisdom equips you to face life in an altogether different manner to the unbeliever. Now, chapters 9 and 10 are beginning to unpack wisdom and folly as they relate to one another as opposites, and they're part of the same argument. This week, we'll see how the battle begins with the, the benefits of wisdom extolled, the, the godly heritage that it is to us. And next time, we'll see the empire of the fool strike back. Tonight, there are just three points. The first will be a brief recap, so um, we, we need to know where we are in order to know where we're going. The second, by far the longest point, will show us the blessedness of wisdom using the example that Solomon gives. And the third, and by the, far the shortest point, will give us a hint of what is to come next when we get there. Then I'll close up with some end comments. So firstly, the recap in which we saw the uncertainty of life should not prevent diligence or joy. A week ago, we began the stretch of Ecclesiastes, and we saw that life has many mysteries, it has enigmas. I'm looking, just recapping verses 1 to 12 there. 
mysteries in life that are beyond our ability to predict, to avoid, to control, or to comprehend even. And chief among them is the reality of suffering and death, even for the righteous, even for the beloved Christian, the child of God. And who's to say what might befall you? Verse 11 says, the race is not to the swift, the, bread, the battle not to the strong, nor the bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favor to those with knowledge, but time and chance happen to them all. For a man does not know his time, like fish that are taken in an evil net, and like birds that are caught in a snare, so the children of man are snared at an evil time when it suddenly befalls them. So the future holds some great uncertainties for you as it does for me. And you cannot bank on 70 or 80 years or even 90 these days and an a comfortable retirement. It's just not guaranteed. Some of you in this room tonight will not live to see that. That is a statistical certainty, I'm tempted to say. And just by virtue of experience in the life of churches, I will say it again. Some of you in this room will not live to the age of 70. Some of you will die younger and some of you may even die young. And I hope that has entered your mind as a possibility. But this great uncertainty about your future is not meant to lead us into despair or fatalism or inactivity so that we sit back and say, what's the point of anything if everything is outside of my control and we're all going to die anyway? It's not meant to paralyze us, leaving us as terrified shut-ins, too afraid to go out of our homes, too afraid to encounter a germ. It's not meant to do for us what I heard happen to a young medical student that I was reading about, who upon cutting open his first medical cadaver, looked with shock at the cold flesh and the muscle and said to his professor, is this all that we are? If so, what's the point of anything? Rather, we saw in verses 7 to 10, that the Christian, the believer, is actively encouraged to live an openly joyful life and to work hard to the best of your abilities. This is your responsibility. But if you are to do this, if you are to navigate this uncertain life with its many pitfalls and its divinely timed trials, if you are to overcome the sinful proclivities of your own heart as I must mine, you must do what Solomon has been urging us to do all along. You must live with wisdom and avoid folly. Because on the one hand, wisdom will both equip and aid you while benefiting others, while on the other hand, folly will both hamper and destroy you while harming others. So choose wisdom. Pick the right side. And just so we're clear in Ecclesiastes, wisdom is equated with fearing the Lord and living righteously. While folly is equated, used synonymously, with wickedness and godlessness. So this isn't just some life lessons about making some good decisions, be wise. Cleanliness is next to godliness or something like that. No, this is an overflow of one standing before the living God, having come to know him by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And from there, your ongoing relationship with him as you daily seek his face and are found obedient to his will. That's wisdom as Solomon would see it. Folly is anything less than that, anything that departs from that. So let's begin now to see something about wisdom in verses 13 to 18, where he unpacks this example. So this is the second and the longest point. Wisdom will be an underappreciated, uh, underappreciated asset for the benefit of all. And here's Solomon's example of wisdom in a fallen world, under the sun, one which he says seems to be great to him. So he's clearly impressed by what he's putting down there. He talks about a little city in the ancient world. A city, by definition back then, would have had walls, so it has some sort of defense capability. But this wasn't an empire's capital like Nineveh or Babylon. It wasn't a thriving trade center like Tyre. This was just your otherwise nondescript little city getting by without drawing much attention to itself. In fact, we are told there that there are few men in it, which was both an economic and a military assessment, few men to defend the city, few men to work the industries that were, were in it. Now one day, this little city woke up to the news that a great king was coming against them. Perhaps the ruler of one of those empires, or perhaps, perhaps just a ruler of a great city-state far more prosperous than their own. 
And maybe a few of the citizens rushed up to the walls of the city. They looked out and they saw a cloud of dust on the horizon. They heard the tramping of feet as the columns of infantry marched in formation. And outriders of cavalry quickly surrounded them, cutting off any opportunity for escape. Then they would have seen the well-oiled military machine of the enemy encircle and besiege them, and how they pitched their tents and plundered the outlying fields and began to build the machinery of war. Catapults or siege towers, battering rams, maybe ballista to hurl those great crossbow bolts, palisades behind which archers could hide and rain down arrows upon the defenders, earthen ramps to gain elevation, and of course many ladders to scale the walls and spread the defenders in more directions than they can guard. Great siege works, says verse 14. <coughs> That's what they saw. And now what can a little city do against such a thing? You can't just conjure up men from nothing. You can't have and raise sons for battle in the space of days and weeks at most. And there's nowhere to turn, nowhere to run, no one to, who knows you need help, let alone who's actually willing to come and offer help against so great a king. Plus, probably those that stand against them are veterans. They're skilled and experienced in war. They, they serve a great king. And back then, great kings became great by conquering other kings. But this little city is not great, has not conquered, and is not battle-hardened like their enemy. Again, the great army amassed outside their walls probably have a great budget to go with it, to equip their men with the the latest and best of weapons and shields and armor, things well maintained, honed to a razor edge. They've got their own traveling blacksmiths and carpenters and fletchers to make arrows, a whole armaments industry going with them in the baggage train. But the little city? Most of them have probably just got a few banged up old swords and bent spears from granddad's days and the plows and shears that they normally use for work. Hardly an army to boast about and few stores to keep them through the siege. So what hope is there for this little city? Staring into the maw of the beast. Soon they're going to be slaughtered and enslaved. There's no way they can withstand this army. And they have nothing really to bargain with, because what, what can they offer that won't just be taken from them, that could not just be taken from them with great ease? Their situation is hopeless. This is the picture that Solomon is painting for us as he stresses this little city with this great king and his great siege works. It's this unbearable contrast that leaves you with no illusions as to the outcome of the battle except for one thing. The race is not always to the swift, nor the battle to the strong. Remember? You see, something unexpected happens in this little city, verse 15. There is found in it a poor, wise man. A poor, wise man, someone says, how can a poor man help you? He has no wealth to hire mercenaries. He has no status to command respect. He has no goods with which to bargain. He has nothing except his wisdom. And by his wisdom, he of all people delivered the city, saved the city. And I, I know the question you're probably asking right now, it's, how did he do it? How did this poor wise man turn away the greedy eyes of this great king? How did this man offset the overwhelming numeric, numerical advantage of the enemy forces? How did he engineer victory when so hopelessly outnumbered and outclassed? And the answer is, we don't know. We're not told. It's not actually relevant to the story. The point is not what he did to, the, to save the city, but rather that it was his wisdom that made it possible. Now, of course, we can speculate if you like. I won't leave you hanging. You know, maybe he had a diplomatic idea that no one else considered. Maybe he tricked them into thinking there was a plague and they turned away. Maybe he created dissent in their ranks of the army and they turned on each other. Uh, uh, but I don't think there's any of those things in any case. 
uh, for reasons I'll get to, uh, get to in a moment. Uh, Solomon just wants us to see that whatever he did, he did because of wisdom. A wisdom which in the context of Ecclesiastes, remember, is the result of the fear of the Lord. A determination to submit to God. That sort of wisdom. So maybe this poor man led his little city in a time of confession and repentance like Nineveh in the day of Jonah so that the Lord turned his wrath away? Or maybe like King Hezekiah praying for deliverance from the armies of Assyria in 2 Kings 19, the individual piety of this one poor man crying out to God led to their deliverance. Or maybe it was a situation like 2 Samuel 20, when during Sheba's rebellion against King David, Sheba took refuge in the city of Abel, and David's general, Joab, came with an army and cast up a mound against the city and stood against its rampart, and they were battering the wall down to throw it down, until suddenly one wise woman called from the city, called to Joab, and reasoned with him, asking for time, and she went back to her people. It says, in her wisdom. Those are the words there. She went back to her people in her wisdom and she persuaded them to kill Sheba, threw his head over the wall, and the armies of Joab withdrew and the city was spared. Maybe it was something like that. But whether the means of saving was something secular, like a clever ruse, or something supernatural, like a miraculous intervention from God, for Solomon's purposes, the point is just that wisdom achieved this. The problem is, though, he admits straight away, is that wisdom often goes unrecognized or unappreciated. Verse 15, yet no one remembered that poor man. Meaning either what he did was so discreet that it didn't find its way into the history books going unremembered, like many acts of heroism and war, more die without the medals they deserve than live to receive them. Or it could just mean that he was simply overlooked in the celebrations that followed. Think of Joseph in Genesis 40, languishing in prison after his wisdom had interpreted the dreams of Pharaoh, uh, the the dreams of Pharaoh's cupbearers and baker, and and Joseph was just forgotten, discarded. Or think of Mordecai, overlooked despite his loyalty in uncovering the assassin's plot against the Persian emperor. Nothing was done for him. His name was a bare notation in the records until the Lord uncovered it amazingly in Esther chapter 6, much later on. Maybe that's what happened to this wise old man. He simply faded from memory. Who? What? What did he do? Or alternatively, his not being remembered may relate to a deliberate attempt to erase his contribution from memory at all. Because no one wants to remember that it was him that delivered them. This nobody, this second class citizen, this undesirable, this Christian. And so, verse 16, the poor man's wisdom was despised and his words are not heard. You can see there's an intentionality to their rejection of him. They're not going to put a statue up for him. They're not going to hold a parade for him. They, They were happy to reap the benefit of his wisdom, just not to follow his example. Happy for the city to be delivered by the hand of God because of this man's wisdom, just not happy to submit to God in faith and repentance afterwards. And and you know what I think of when I think of this? I think of all the the countries of the world that were once called Christendom. In other words, all those countries that, loosely speaking, uh, uh, make up the Western world, which flourished once in large part because of Christianity's influence and God's subsequent blessings allowing for just laws and critical thinking and freedom of speech and artistic beauty despite all the lingering sins and problems that they still had. How they benefited from that old wisdom that once feared and freely acknowledged God. But now those same countries forget the ancient paths. And more than that, they They openly despise them. And the wisdom of the gospel is 
ignored, it's rejected, it's loathed even, sometimes criminalized. You can't even openly evangelize in some parts of Europe. And now all manner of folly, of wickedness, the opposite of wisdom, is tolerated and celebrated instead. And the wisdom of the old wise man, it's despised. His words not heard. This is our world, brothers and sisters. This is our land. Or again, if not whole countries, then think of the wayward son or daughter leaving a Christian home and the example of their wise and godly parents, that wisdom was once cherished, that, that once cherished and, and guarded them, that, that wisdom that helped them avoid so many sorrows, uh, their, their wisdom, the wisdom of these parents delivered the child, if not his soul, no, but probably his life many times, her life many times. Yet now that the child has grown up, They're flexing their newfound freedom. They've got their own ideas and opinions. They've got some cash in their wallet. They've got the keys to their own car. And they've come to despise the wisdom that reared them. They don't want to hear the counsel of their parents anymore. This is just one of those bothersome enigmas of life. That it can happen in a Christian home. That a person can be raised with godly parents, raised in the environment of the church, hearing the Lord, exposed to its tr- the truths of God's Word, tasting of the good things to come, and then say, I don't want this. I'm turning from this God, His Word, His will, His ways. I don't want to hear it. I despise it. Because that's what it comes down to. If you reject the truth, you despise it. And yet, verse 16, Solomon still insists on something. He says, but I say that wisdom is better than might, though the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. In other words, don't don't give up on this old man biblical wisdom. Don't think that just because it's sometimes rejected that it has no place or benefit. Yes, to be a follower of Jesus Christ, to step into the ways of godly wisdom, may see you despised, may see you written off, may see you lonely, may see you isolated from your community, may see you unmarried, and your words will not be heard, and your name will be erased from any favorable record of history. But God-fearing wisdom is still better than strength, better than might. Better than wealth. Better than an abundance of blessings that you can imagine. Why? Well, for the full answer to that question, we'll have to get to chapter 10. But the immediate answer is fairly simple. Because wisdom saved the city. Because the fruit of wisdom can be seen around you. The ultimate answer comes later, because God will bring every decision into judgment, chapter 12. And there, wisdom will be justified. And we will say, Amen! to everything that we scratch our heads about here on earth. We can't yet behold that day of judgment though, so we must take it on faith, but we can behold such fruit of wisdom as is already seen in the present. It was God-fearing wisdom that caused whatever good is presently in our society to exist at all, even though fools are still trying to tear it all down. You know, why, why is it that Atheistic North Korea is such an undesirable place to live despite its military strength, while South Korea has a strong Christian witness and stands noticeably apart. Why do you think it is that many countries which hardly had a Christian footprint in their history are often so cruel, intolerant, and failing as states and whose citizens are eager to escape from, while those countries that had a strong Christian heritage, despite all their faults, are places that people escape to. It's because by wisdom, God delivers a person, a city, a people, a nation. That is by the fear of God that produces such wisdom. So truly, yes, the wisdom that comes from fearing the Lord Jesus Christ and implementing His will is better than any force of arms that can be mustered by militant kings or dictators, is better than any amount of wealth or any treasures that you can imagine. As Jesus said, wisdom 
is justified by her children. Wisdom is vindicated, shown to be true by the results. And those positive results of seeing godly wisdom work itself out in a person's life, in a family, in a church, in a nation, those have benefited even unbelievers, even as they have benefited Christians. They've not saved unbelievers, but the, the benefits of that, that blessing of, of God working in that, that situation have benefited them, as I spoke of in talking about those countries. That's why we have so many freedoms that we enjoy in the West compared to the tyranny of many countries that don't have the Christian heritage. And notice then Solomon says, verse 17, the words of the wise and quiet are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. So he's still talking about wisdom. If you want examples of verse 17, you can turn your mind to the history of politics. I don't know if you can perhaps think of any shouting rulers among fools, self-important blowhards, pompous, arrogant men who think volume is leadership and ranting is wisdom. Every country has them. What's worse is that people vote for them. Why? Because verse 17, they attract fools and sin is foolishness. And of course, this foolish shouting leader could also be a leader of a business, a leader of a company, a leader of a church, a leader of a family. Someone who thinks that to raise their voice is to get results, and sometimes it appears to, but for all the wrong reasons. Yet even so, even now, even though the loudmouth gets more attention, Solomon, Solomon still says, the words of the wise heard in quiet are better. You want to spend your time wisely? Don't go to the political rally. Don't follow the guy with the biggest megaphone and the most bombastic personality and the most Twitter followers. Don't follow the crowd as they flock to false shepherds or fools. Don't follow the example of a corporate tyrant, the braggart businessman tycoon who writes a book about how, about how to get people to do what you want. Don't vote for him when he runs for office. Rather... Find a gentle, quiet, wise man and listen to him. A wise woman, ladies, and hear their counsel. It might not have the effect that you hope for on the political stage, but it would be better, says Solomon, than might, better than the shouting of a ruler, better than the weapons of war. Wisdom is valuable. To follow the Lord, fearing his name, obeying his word, trembling at his power, delighting in his person, taking joy in his gifts, this is better, better than any words or effort wicked and foolish people might offer or undertake. So choose wisdom. Start here. Start with Christ. He is the rock you want to build upon. And if you do, who knows? Might not God bring the fruit of wisdom again? Another reformation of his church, another revival in a nation as he's done so often in the past, another transformation of society. Maybe. Maybe not. You don't know. You don't need to know. You just have to be faithful. So wisdom will be an underappreciated asset that benefits all. Then thirdly and briefly, before some closing comments, folly will be a powerful foil to the detriment of many. Last part of verse 18. Having shown us the benefit of wisdom, having told us that it is better than strength, Solomon now makes what seems to be a surprising statement. He says, verse 18, wisdom is better than the weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. And this is setting the stage for the next part of his argument. In other words, all the good work of wisdom might be undone by a single act of foolishness. A good reputation ruined by a moment of self-indulgent madness. A scholarship at a top-tier university withdrawn because the student cheated or misused campus property a 20-year marriage torn apart because of an affair a promising career ended with criminal charges because of office theft 
An athlete tipped for greatness loses everything in a crash while driving under the influence. A growing economy wrecked by the militant aspirations of its wicked ruler. Oh, your wisdom is better, wisdom is stronger, and as much as it always proves to be right in the long term, as God brings every deed into judgment, wisdom will indeed prove to be a wonderful asset for many who benefit from the decisions of the wise, but all it takes is one sinner, one reckless act, and much good is reduced to memory and ashes. And this is what chapter 10 will develop further when we see the empire of the fool strike back. It speaks to us there of the foolishness of folly. And it encourages us again to be wise. So as we wrap up, what then should a person go out of their way to be doing? It's pretty obvious. Choose wisdom. Every day, every moment, on your knees, in prayer, in the company of God's people. Seek the wisdom that is above. As far as it depends on you, find yourself on the side of wisdom, not folly, because folly will destroy you. And if this is all new to you, then know again that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So you must begin with a turning to and submission before the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the personification of wisdom. He is the fullness of God in bodily form. He is the quintessential wise man who by his wisdom saves a city. Remember what Jesus did? By one act of wisdom, he covered the sins of countless fools. Me. One, yes, one sinner can destroy much good, verse 18. But one act of goodness by the only good man, the, G, the Lord Jesus Christ, will save many sinners. Here's the wonder of Jesus' death on the cross and the gospel that it secures. He who knew no sin, who knew no folly, became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. By a single sacrifice, he has secured for all time those who are being sanctified, those who have put their faith in his death on their behalf. By his grace, by his blood, by his righteousness, the wise one saves his bride, the church, a church which later in Revelation is called a city, if you want to carry the imagery all the way through. He is the wise man, the poor man, the despised man who saved a city, saved his church, saved sinners. And as with the wise man here in Solomon's illustration, for many, this Jesus Christ is not remembered. For many, his wisdom is despised. For many, his words are no longer heeded. They do not listen. They turn away. But if you would be wise, repent and believe in him. Pursue the wisdom that he is pleased to grant to those who seek his face. That is to the sincere Christian. James 1, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given him. Some of you are sitting here wondering all this talk about wisdom. How do I become wise? Ask God. Go to God. God, make me wise. But notice there's a warning in James 1 because he talks about let him ask without doubt and without being and says the one who doubts is double-minded. And we need to understand something here. That's not to condemn the weak Christian coming with less than perfect faith and who is sincerely trying to, try, crying out for help. Rather, the doubt there is qualified by the phrases of, that follow. Double-mindedness. Double-mindedness, in other words, meaning half in, half out. Uncommitted to this Jesus Christ. Disloyal to the word, but kind of liking parts of it. Don't come asking for wisdom if you're not serious about following Christ. If you've got one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom. If you're not ready to do what he tells you to do. Such a person, says James, should not expect God's help. But the weak, the weary, the struggling, the sincere Christian who calls on the Lord, let them come. And find a gracious Savior, a merciful Savior, who welcomes the heavy laden and builds up our feeble faith. If you would be wise, turn to Christ. 
Humble yourself before the mighty hand of God. Pursue holiness. Fight the good fight with all your might. Ask for his grace to avoid the folly of fools and start to put in practice those habits that make for wisdom. Philip Riken again puts together a, a little list in his commentary on how to apply wisdom to ordinary living. I'm just going to summarize it and read it to you as I go. He says, it is wise for us to be thankful, to celebrate God's blessings every day for basic provisions of our daily bread, for our brothers and sisters in Christ, for the beautiful world that he has made, and for all the benefits that we have in Christ. Wisdom is seen in thankfulness. Then it is wise for us to be content with whatever God gives and with whatever God does not give, including usually very limited information about the future. Content. It's also wise for us to be prayerful. God loves to answer godly prayer. Prayer reminds us who is in control, so we come asking rather than dictating. Prayer also gives us something to do with our worry. Thankful, content, prayerful, and wisdom is humble rather than putting confidence in our own abilities. And again, if we are wise, we will strive to be generous. God has promised to bless the cheerful giver. Wisdom is also faithful, he says. If the future is unpredictable, then we need to leave the results of what we do up to God. Still, we need to do the things that God has called us to do and then trust him to use what, what we do however he pleases to use it. And lastly, he says, wisdom is hopeful. Hopeful, far from making man fatalistic, knowing that time and chance happen to all should teach us to put our hope in Christ. And, end quote. And, and that, that's not complicated, is it? I mean, that's Christianity 101. That's what we teach our children in Sunday school. That's what we, we drill into them as though it was simple, and yet we forget. And we need to come back to those simple things. You know, every time we lose the rugby, what do the coaches come out and say? We need to get back to the, the basics. I mean, why? Because the basics are so important. And here is the importance of basic biblical wisdom seen in thankfulness, contentment, prayer, humility, generosity, faithfulness, and hope. It's the path to wisdom. And it's the path of wisdom. It's where you will find the wise already walking. And the great saints of previous ages were ordinary people, all ordinary believers, just living thankful, contented, prayerful, humble, generous, faithful, hopeful lives. That's all. Not super saints. Not following some secret plan that their Bibles had that ours don't. Not going, not, not, not grown beyond those basics as though they didn't need them. But just men and women and boys and girls who feared the Lord and walked in his ways, the simple wisdom of the Bible. And by their wisdom, great things were accomplished in their time, things which we still benefit from in ours. This is the heritage of godly wisdom. Will you pray with me as we close? Our Father in heaven, when we must speak of the wise or consider the ways of wisdom, immediately we feel our shortcomings and our sins only show up our folly all the more. So we would ask you, our Lord and God, by the strength of your Spirit and because of the merits of your Son alone, will you help us to be wise? Give us wisdom. Help us to come to you without a divided, double-mindedness and uncommittedness to your ways and your word. And let us come simply let us come sincerely and help us to do that which we must do and know we should do so that we might become what we should be. May we be thankful, contented, generous, faithful, serving people, for then we shall be wise. We ask for your grace. Amen.